Hey everybody and welcome to chapter 9. We are talking about concepts, categories, and knowledge in this chapter. So it's a good change of pace from last chapter. Uh, and actually the last three chapters we were just talking about memory. So we're, we're, we're making a big transition here. Um, we're going to talk about memory because there's a reason why this one is positioned as chapter 9 right after uh, the memory chapters. But you'll see that we are starting, uh, you know I'm, I'm rolling up my sleeve so you know we're about to get to work. Um, but you'll, you'll notice that this one is, is, is a pretty big departure from the previous chapters. And that's because the next three chapters we're going to cover in our class all form a new unit. Uh, and this is like our third unit basically. And if this one has a theme, I think that this theme is abstraction. What do I mean by that? I think that the three chapters that we're going to be covering in this unit are all kind of concentrated on how do we take specific examples of things we see in the world around us and how do we abstract them? How do we internalize those lessons so that we can generalize to the rest of the world? Um, in, in this chapter, we're gonna be talking about, about concepts. So how is that we see a couple of examples of what a bird is and then have an idea of what a bird is in our brain. That's what this chapter is all about. The next chapter is about language. Language is about, you know, essentially how do you take communication for this one idea, like I want food, those three words. Why is it that the word I, we understand as meaning ourselves and meaning not just our bodies, but also our mind and our individuality, right? So like, how do we abstract from, from um, a syllable, you know, that is a word into something that means something much greater than that? That's chapter 10. Language is a very big chapter. And then we're going to be skipping chapter 11, moving into chapter 12, which is all about decision making. Decision making and reasoning and logic and things like that, which is, you know, like logic is all about abstraction, right? You can't pick up a piece of logic in the world around you it's because logic is a process that you can apply onto multiple exemplars. Um, all right, so I already used the word exemplar which means that it's time to get into this chapter because we're going to be talking a lot about exemplars in this uh, in this unit. Uh, all right, so for chapter nine, we are going to be looking at concepts and categories. We're going to, and I'm, I'm changing this up quite a bit from how I used to teach it. Um, and also you'll find that um, while I do talk about a bunch, a bunch of the big ideas from this chapter, that what I cover in this video is going to cover chapter 9, but maybe a little bit differently, kind of in, in not the same layout and organization as what you see in the textbook. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking about schemas, which is an idea that we started in chapter 8. We're going to talk more about concepts and categories. We'll talk about this weird study that looked at whether or not pigeons can appreciate art. And then we'll kind of wrap all that up by talking about what this means about our memory. How is it that we encode this information and retrieve it later? So the videos that I have for you here today, um, I think, you know, usually I, I give you some recommendations about, you know, which one do I think is the important one. I think if you had to choose, I don't think any of these are must watches this week, to be honest with you, but I do think that this one is really interesting and that students generally have some complicated reactions to this one. This, uh, this video about pigeons appreciating art. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about this in more detail later in the, in the lecture, which is why I think it might be a good idea for you to check it out. Maybe not now, but maybe later. I'll prompt you when. The other videos here, this one is specifically about how schemas can affect our ability to remember things. So if you're feeling a little bit rusty about schemas and memory, this can be a nice refresher video. Uh, and then finally, we have this other one that is about abstract concepts and pigeons. And I wanted to include this one because uh, I probably mention it every video that when I was in grad school, my work and my thesis was all about non-human cognition. Specifically, it was about how do non-humans, um, or can non-humans, is it possible for non-humans to be able to learn abstract concepts? And the, 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 um, the animals that we use, we use pigeons, um, we compared those with, with monkeys and apes, and we compared those with humans, and we compared them later on, after my time there, with dogs and other canines. Um, so, um, I liked this video because when I was watching it, I was like, hey, they're talking about it correctly, and I like that they were getting all the information right because when, when you start talking about 
the cognition that human that sorry that non-humans may or may not have you're going to find so much misinformation on the internet and a lot of people just guessing and stuff like that this video i think does a good job of kind of talking about the state of the science uh, all right so let's get into it we're picking up with schemas um, i'm going to start out with an interactive example um, well maybe not super interactive because you can't tell me what you think uh, but this is a um, this is well I'm gonna I'm gonna let this show on the screen for a second. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about this place. Normally I would tell you to tell me about it, but I want you to make maybe three, say three or four statements about this place that you think are true. What is it? Where is it? You know, what is its function? What's on the inside? You know, things like that. So think about this place. All right. So if I were to ask you, what kind of place is this? You almost certainly know that it's a restaurant, right? Um, sorry, I almost forgot how to spell restaurant. Um, so you know it's a restaurant. Why do you know it's a restaurant? I don't see the word restaurant anywhere here, right? So how do you know it's a restaurant? You know that it's a restaurant on a, on a couple of factors, right? You see there's a drive through window. That's a big thing. Another thing is that it has burgers, BBQ, hot dogs, and shakes right next to it. You also see the name of the place, Cookout. That The name Cookout sounds like uh, a restaurant. You even see the drive through place over here. You see the big sign over here. It's located kind of in the shopping uh, or the strip mall area, this outlet mall area. So you get an idea that it's probably going to be for eating. It's a restaurant. Um, but how do you know that? Because whenever I ask about this, a lot of folks in New England have never been to Cookout before. Cookout is a restaurant franchise that I think is kind of in the mid-Atlantic region. I see a lot of them in Virginia and North Carolina. And I see um, they were kind of spreading out into the southeast before I moved out of there. Um, but so this is not a chain that you may have seen before, and yet you would know a lot about it just from looking at it. You can guess exactly what kind of clothes you need to wear in order to enter this restaurant. You can probably guess how much it costs. You can probably guess how long it's going to take you to find, or, you know, to get uh, your food. And you can probably guess how, I already said how much the food is going to cost, but you can already guess um, the nutritional value of that food too. You can guess all of these things and be really, really accurate about it. But why? Why are you accurate about it? You're accurate about it because of schemas. Because you have the ability to kind of um, um, look at previous examples of restaurants just like this and then come up with a broader category of that, of that idea. In this case, that broader category is fast food restaurants, right? So whenever you go in, you know that you're probably not going to be seated anywhere. You're not going to have a waiter. You're not going to have to put on a bib, right? Uh, you don't need to wear a tie or a tuxedo. You're going to go to the front of the counter. You're going to, you know, you're going to say something. It's probably going to cost like $13. You're going to pick it up and you're going to leave and it's going to be about 3,000 calories or whatever, right? That's, that's probably what you guessed, right? Um, and the reason why you're able to come up to those educated guesses is because of your previous experiences. So you're generalizing. And what we mean by generalizing is that you're looking at one example and you're assuming that the lessons of that example are going to carry over to new examples. And that's what you're doing here when you go to a fast food restaurant you've never been to before. Um, so if you were to walk into an unfamiliar room, how would you react if you saw that everyone was sitting and eating dinner and there were servers walking around? good chance that, well, depending on if you are going there expecting there to be food, that you might hang out towards the entrance and just look around and look for somebody wearing all black, right? Because they're probably the host or the hostess and they can, they can seat you. But what if you go in and everybody is seated face facing forward while there's somebody in the front of the room speaking? Then good chance that you know to either enter very quietly and find a seat on your own or to just not come in because it looks like it might be a rude time to do that. But what would you do if you came to the same room and everybody was standing around apparently talking with one another? You would again act very differently than you would in those previous two examples. Why? Because of schemas. Because of what you have learned in the past, you're generalizing to new situations, con con I almost said concurrently, currently. Um, so a schema is kind of like a blueprint. It's a blueprint for how we should behave based on our understanding of that situation. Um, and as you can see, like, this kind of sounds like a category or a concept. I said like a fast food restaurant, that feels like a category of a restaurant, doesn't it? 
Um, so that's kind of what, what we are looking at here. So let's talk about why are schemas efficient? Why are they useful? One reason that is really important, we talked about this in chapter eight, one reason that schemas are really efficient and really useful is because they allow us to not have to learn every single instance of a fast food. I'm gonna keep using fast food restaurant as the example here. Um, we don't need to learn the routine all over again for this restaurant called Cookout. We have a pretty good idea of what to expect there, right? Just like how whenever you went into Wendy's or Burger King or Hardee's or Checkers or McDonald's or Subway or um, Taco Bell or Popeyes or whatever, um, whenever you first went into those places, you probably didn't have to learn all over again that you don't need a menu, that you're going to go up to the front counter and order from there, right? Um, and so whenever you go into a new one, you don't have to relearn all of those things all over again. You don't have to relearn exactly what to do because you're applying your schema for fast food restaurants. Now it'd be very different if you went into an Applebee's, right? An Applebee's we know is a restaurant. We know it's not a fast food restaurant. That is a restaurant that you're probably gonna sit down, right, with, with people. Um, and so you behave yourself very differently. And so if you were to go to cookout, if you walked in and you noticed that it looked more like Applebee's, then you're probably not going to look for the front counter to order something from. You're probably going to look for a host or hostess now to find somewhere to sit. Um, so is there a situation that will perfectly fit any kind of schema? Not usually, but we are going to talk about how some of these situations, some of these fast food restaurants are going to be closer to our idealized example of a schema or of a fast food restaurant than others. So for me, like uh, McDonald's is the go-to fast food place, right? Subway, on the other hand, I almost didn't lump that in. It is fast food though, right? But I almost didn't lump that in with the others because it doesn't have all the same things that all the fast food places do, right? That one, like that one, you actually have to wait there while somebody, like while you tell them what to put on your food, right? Like that is different. So that is an example where that fast food restaurant doesn't fit into all the same kind of defaults that the idea of a fast food restaurant does. So we're going to talk about this later today in this chapter as a matter of processing and reaction time, which is to say that something that really fits our schema, that gets really close to fitting our schema perfectly, is going to have very fast reaction times and, have, and not require that much mental processing but that informate or that new examples that are very far away from our schema that don't really fit our schema that well are going to have very slow reaction times. So for example, if I said, what about Domino's? Is Domino's fast food? I have to think about it, right? So I have a slower reaction time because I am requiring more processing. I have to think about it more. Is Domino's fast food? Well, you have to wait like 10 minutes to get your pizza. The price is kind of fast foody. The taste is kind of fast foody. And I guess you do kind of sit there, right? Like you order at the front counter. You're, and I think most Domino's you can't eat inside anymore. So I guess it is fast food, right? But that's not our kind of perfect, you know, um, schema for a fast food. It takes a while for us to do that. So this chapter is all about how we are going to create these concepts that guide our behavior. So here's an example. If I ask, and I'm going to ask you for the next couple of slides, is this a cup? And you, all you have to do is answer yes or no. So is this a cup, yes or no? I would say yes. 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 Mm, yeah. Yes. Okay, in all those cases, I said yes for all of them, but if you're like me and you're playing along at home, you may have found that there were some of these examples that took a little bit longer for you to say yes than others, right? So for me, like this one, I said yes almost immediately, right? This cup right here. When it was this, number four, I really hesitated, right? Because when I looked at this, I was like, wait a second, that looks like it could be a bowl. It looks like a bowl with a handle, and I think maybe it is. So if I had to change my answer, I might actually say that maybe that's not a, uh, not a cup. Excuse me, that, that is a bowl. Um, likewise, this one right here, number 17, that's a cup, but I don't know, it almost looks like a wine glass, right? Um, so why is it that some of these seem to slow us down and some of them don't? The reason why is that the closer something is to your schema or your concept of what a cup is, then that is going to change how fast 
we can do this or how fast we re how fast we recognize it so for example this cup right here which i responded very quickly on that must be very close to my internal concept of what a cup is because i responded very quickly that that is a cup this one over here number four took me a little bit longer which means that maybe it is very far away from my perfect example of what a cup is um, which means that if i had to try to define what a cup is that whatever is go you know that whatever my idealized representation of a cup is it must be kind of round it must have a handle and it and the depth of it must not be shallower than its width if that makes sense that this one looks so oblong that i was hesitant to say that it's a cup um all right so things that are further away like this number four or this number 17 or even this number nine because they're further away from my idealized representation of a cup takes me a little bit longer and we say that that's a disadvantage in cognitive processing all right so now is a good good time to take a quick break if you if you want to um because we're going to be changing gears up a little bit as we start talking about how it is that we start forming these concepts and categories all right so this is really tricky talking about concepts and categories and how they are the same or how they are different because everybody uses different definitions um even textbooks i've used you know as as i've taught cognitive psychology i've used three different textbooks the one that we're using is the one i like the most but i would say that all three of those textbooks have a slightly different kind of explanation for what concepts are or at least their definitions so i want to take a quick chance or a quick moment to kind of make sure that we are all on the same page here which is the same page as your textbook as well so a category is generally going to be what we refer to as a natural concept in other words a category is something that has physical similarities with other things so a category for a f uh, for a phone for example that would be um, the category of phone means that it is something that is about this size, thinner than it is tall, uh, that you can hold it in your hand, um, or is about the, you know, the size of your hand that you can hold, um, that they generally come in monochromatic colors like white or black, um, that they have a hard screen that's usually made of some kind of glass uh, here in the front, um, and uh, that have these, these little holes that you can put things in uh, down at the bottom. Uh, so that is an example of a cate you know, category of a cup. Um, now you'll notice that I didn't say something. I didn't say that you could make a call on it, right? I didn't say that you could surf the web on it. And the reason for that is because we're just looking at physical characteristics. We're not talking about what these things do. We're not talking about their functions. We're not talking about how they behave or what purpose they have to us. Those are going to be concepts those are what we refer to as abstract concepts. So abstract concepts really focus on the relationships that things have. So if I'm talking about this phone and I'm trying to say how this phone is different from this iPad, right? Because this iPad is essentially a giant phone if we're just sticking to, you know, the, the definition that I was describing of its physical characteristics. So what's different about them? What's different about them is that this can make phone calls. I can call somebody up on it, right? Uh, that this can fit in my pocket. And those are two kinds of things that are um, not exactly physical characteristics. Yes, they describe physical aspects of it, but they are really emphasizing the relationship that this has with us, that I can make a phone call with it, that I can fit it into my pocket, um, that, um, mm, that it's smaller than a laptop computer uh, as an example so abstract concepts really kind of emphasize the relationships or the functions that things have so for example an abstract concept would be heavier than the abs the the concept of heaviness is an abstract concept the the concept of brightness or of sameness or differentness those are all abstract concepts too uh, so if i say that a dog is heavier than cats then what i'm saying here is maybe less about the dog itself and more about how the dog relates to the cat we know that it is heavier we don't know how heavy the dog is but we know that compared to the cat it is heavier just like compared to the ipad that this is smaller 
Um, so we can't say that a phone is small, right? But we can say that a phone is smaller than, than an iPad. All right, so, and if this gets very confusing, it's because people have been arguing over this stuff forever. Uh, and um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein. Um, if you've taken a philosophy class here at Westfield, you may have talked about him a little bit. Um, he is kind of a, he's kind of a one-hit wonder, and I say that in a flattering way. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to diss uh, Ludwig over here. Uh, as you can see, he doesn't look like he has a great sense of humor, right? This is like a mug shot. Um, but um, in his lifetime, he if he published only really one thing, um, one big thing that really caught notice, and it wasn't until after he passed away that more of his stuff was published and kind of appreciated. And so he's kind of a one-hit wonder at his time. Uh, and he wasn't a psychologist; he's a philosopher, and um, he talks a lot in his publications about, or the things that are published, uh, about the nature of language and how they represent things um, that we discuss and, and that we reckon with. And he had a lot to say about the limitations of language. And in, in one of his kind of thought experiments, as he's trying to talk about language, he talks about, um, about how some things can't really be defined easily and talks about games. This is the example that he gives. Is, uh, is try to define what a game is. And if you want to, um, whenever I teach this in the classroom, usually I will, I'll take a, a couple of minutes and I will say, all right, folks, tell me, what is a game? You know, tell me some, something about a game. What are some things that, that games do? And I'll get a lot of people, and I'll write this up on the board, you know, whatever people say. People will say, okay, if it's a game, it has to require teams. Okay, so it's team-based. Um, there needs to be points or involved. Okay, I put points on the board. There needs to be a winner and a loser. Okay, I write that down. Uh, it needs to have some kind of physical, you know, component to it. I write that down. Um, and so here are some examples of that. You can see I've I created a couple um, here, but we can say that some definitions for what a game is: that games are played for ch played by children. They're for fun. They have rules. They involve multiple people. They're competitive and they are played. Again, for fun, they're played during leisure. They're not played during work hours. It sounds pretty good, right? I like this definition. It seems pretty good of game. But you'll notice that each one of these things, and, this, and the reason why I tried to move quickly through this is because if you look at these definitions for too long, you'll notice that each of them, you can find examples where that's not the case, right? So for example, if I said, oh, it's played by children. Well, what about slot machines, right? Or what about poker? Poker is a game, right? Um, but it shouldn't be played by children, right, because it's gambling. Um, slot machines shouldn't be played by kids because they're gambling. Um, so, okay, so maybe not everything, not, so maybe games don't have to be for children. Okay, so we can say that this is not a good definition because we can find at least one example where that's not the case. All right, what about engaged in for fun? Well, if you ask Tom Brady, you know, um, or maybe Tom Brady's not, not a good example because he left the Patriots. Um, uh, just think of your favorite athlete. Uh, if you were to ask your favorite athlete, you know, is it fun? You know, is your sport fun? Like, I don't think LeBron James is going to say like, oh yeah, like basketball is a ton of fun, right? Because for him, this is business. This is like, it. it's about like doing his job and doing it the best he can. It's, you know, he probably doesn't have a lot of fun during a game. So we can say, all right, so professional sports, you know, professional football, basketball, they're not engaged in for fun. So maybe that's not a good definition for fun, for games either. What about has rules? Okay, well, if you're playing with Legos, if you're playing with sticks outside, if you're playing with blocks, those can be games, but they don't really have rules. So that's not a good example either. Uh, what about if it involves multiple people? Okay, well, this one is, to me, is the easiest to rule out. Any video game, you know, most video games, all right, maybe not most, a lot of video games are single player and you can't play them with other people. It's like solitaire. Uh, so, okay, so that's not a good definition either because we can think of lots of examples why that's not the case. What about if they are competitive? Here's one that, and and I put tea party here because I, cause tea parties are a game. And those of you that were kids and if you played a tea party, you know that it is a game. Um, I had, I had, sometimes I have students that are like, wait a second, tea party's not a game. Okay, so Dungeons and Dragons, for example. Dungeons and Dragons is a game, right? It's not really a competitive game because you and your friends are playing together, right? So it's cooperative and it is a game. Uh, so that's not an example. But if you're still, if you're like, wait a second, tea party and Dungeons and Dragons don't count as games. Um, 
let me think of, of, of another game then. Um, what is a game that is not competitive? Um, I mean, Solitaire isn't competitive, right? Unless you want to say, like, competing against yourself. Um, but I don't feel like you really have to. So I'm going to say that it doesn't need to be competitive in order for it to be a game. Um, just like there's there's plenty of games, you know, like video games or whatever you can think of that you can't lose, right? And if that's the case, then, then we can cross this one out. And then finally, is played during leisure time. But there's a good chance that you have... Um, I put flying simulators here because pilots, for example, use flying simulators and, and folks that are in the military use different simulators. And those are not for, they're, those are during work hours. Those are during training hours. They are not done during our downtime, just like professional sports. So none of these definitions work good for us, for our definition of a game, right? Because all of them have examples that can be exceptions. And that is one important rule as we start talking about concepts and categories that as we start talking about these, there's almost always going to be an exception to these. It's very rare that when we talk about concepts or categories that we're going to find something that has absolutely no exemptions, absolutely no you know, um, um, uh, exceptions that could disprove it, that almost everything is going to have some kind of, you know, Ex you know, example that, that proves it wrong. Well, not proves it wrong, but, but makes the case a little bit less clear than you might think. All right, so with that in mind, let's talk about what constitutes a mammal. So I asked you what create, you know, what is a game? If I asked you what is a mammal, I want you to think to yourself for just a moment. If someone asked you, what is a your five-year-old niece? She said, auntie so-and-so, what's a mammal? Can you tell me what a mammal is? Think for a second. What would you tell this person? Okay. So, what did you tell them? Because sometimes people will, there's kind of really two different ways. One is that you give like a list of things of what a mammal is. And the other one is that you maybe just like uh, point to an example, right? Where you either kind of give a list of, of, of items that, you know, that all mammals have. Or you say, you know, like a dog. A dog is a mammal, and other animals like dogs are also mammals. So, if you, um, you'll see in the book, the, a good portion of the book, a lot of the book talks about the difference between prototypes and exemplars. That when we start talking about how we conceptualize the world around us, we do so in either a prototypical way or an exemplar-based way. So there are two ways in which we can answer the question, what is a mammal? Uh, the prototype view, and we're going to go over each of these in more detail. The prototype view is where you think about one specific animal, or sorry, you think about one specific really good example, and you really use that as your basis for answering the question. The other view, which is exemplar view, is that you think of lots of other uh, examples, and you start thinking about what they have that they share, and you're going to use that to, to answer the question, what is a mammal? All right, so each of these, are these mammals, each of these animals? When I ask this in the classroom, I get a lot of uncertainty. People generally say yes, but they're cautious. Why are they cautious? Because both of these are examples of mammals that kind of have exceptions to the rules that we define mammals. What are those exceptions? Well, our friend, the bat here, bats fly. Right? Can you think of any other mammal that flies? And don't say a flying squirrel because they glide. They don't really fly. They don't fly like bats do. Right? Um, what about this? The platypus. Right? Um, Duckbill platypus. Why is a platypus hard to classify as a mammal? Because they are classified as a mammal. They are a smaller. Um, in case you're curious, I know a lot about platypuses actually. Uh, they're actually called monotremes. There's only a handful of monotremes that are mammals. The other one is the spiny echidna. And they're all found in Australia where everything is weird, right? Um, but the reason why um, spiny echidnas and platypuses, or platypi, platypodus, depending on your, your pluralization of it, uh, the reason why this one is hard to classify as a mammal is because they lay eggs. Uh, so they don't have live birth. Bats do, right? Dogs do, lions do, they have live birth, but they can't fly, nor they can they, they lay eggs, right? So there are some, exam some examples of exemptions here, and as you may have felt, whenever you're trying to de de determine, is this a mammal, 
you slow down. You, you hesitate before you give an answer because you have to think about it. If I asked you, is a lion a mammal? You'd a you answer almost immediately, yes. So why is that? Let's, let's investigate. Okay, so the first view of how we form concepts is called the prototypical view. The prototypical view is kind of like, if I were to ask you, what is a mammal? And the first thing that comes to your mind is another mammal. And you're going to start thinking about that mammal as an idealized example. That's using the prototype view. Because if I ask you what is a mammal and the first thing that pops into your head is a lion or a dog or a gorilla and you start saying things like, well, they have fur, they have forward-facing eyes, they live outside, they're awake during the day and asleep at night, they have warm blood, they have live birth, uh, they have spines, um, and, and central nervous system. They have eyes and a mouth and a nose. Um, and as I'm doing that and I'm thinking about what a dog has, what a lion has, or what a gorilla has, right? So if I'm doing that and I'm just thinking about one example, then I'm using my prototype view here. Um, and what happens is that um, we have to learn the exceptions to this. We have to learn for example, okay, a platypus is a mammal, but it doesn't lay eggs because it is an exemption. Or uh, a bat is a mammal, but most mammals don't fly, but bats can. Or a dolphin can swim and spends most of its time underwater, but most mammals spend their time above land. So in that case, if you're trying to, 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 to learn about the members of that category that are a little bit harder, is you essentially have to do that on a case-by-case -case basis makes it really hard to remember that they are mammals or if I want to give you other examples um, like uh, how a penguin is also a bird even though a penguin can't fly, right? Um, all right, so the further away uh, these, like a the further away a platypus or a bat is from a lion, which is my prototype, the harder it is for me to classify them as a mammal. All right, um, the way that people measure uh, prototypes um, in cognitive psychology is with the census verification task and this is a task you can actually do online if you have uh, the the zaps code for your textbook if you bought it new where essentially you're gonna answer yes or no or true or false to these questions so number one is pigeons are birds yes or no blue jays are birds alligators are birds robins are birds penguins are birds pumpkins are birds ostriches are birds and so as you are doing this, or as somebody is doing this, they're going to say, okay, yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no, yes. Okay, so in this case, if we look at the yeses, this one was fast, this one was fast, this one was fast, this one was slow, and this one was slow too. Why is that? Because the penguin and the ostrich are very different from my prototypical view of what a bird is. If you ask me to, uh, you know, what is a bird, the first thing that pops in my head is probably going to be a pigeon, right? Um, or, you know, a, a blue jay or a sparrow, you know, some, a small kind of bird that, that hangs out in trees. Um, all right, so the sentence verification task, um, which I said, like I said, you can, you can take um, online if you want. Uh, it is very easy, right? I didn't get any of these wrong. Right, you can check my, you can double check my work on this. I didn't get any of them wrong. Um, so accuracy is not really the dependent variable that we're all that interested in here. We are more interested in the reaction time. So how long does it take for people to respond on this task? And what we find is that the closer uh, examples are to your prototype that you have in mind, the faster you are in saying yes or no. Um, so if I'm thinking about a pigeon and I'm trying to classify these things as birds, when I get to a, a penguin, I slow down because a pigeon and a penguin look totally different. They behave totally differently. They live in different parts of the world. Um, their customs are very different. Their diets are very different. It's so far away from my prototype. So my reaction time is slower as I'm trying to think about whether or not that's a bird. And the same is true for an ostrich. So here, if I am saying that a robin is, uh, sorry, this is kind of a fuzzy example, but if a robin is my, uh, my prototype, uh, that ostriches and emus and hummingbirds and penguins are going to be a little bit slower because they're very, very different from a robin, right? Uh, I feel like hummingbird is not as different as these other three, um, but you get the idea. 
you can find this in your book. I thought this was really, really interesting where they were doing a ratings task here. Um, so this is a little bit different than sentence verification where essentially they uh, here to study you know, to the, the degree to which something belongs to a category or not. What they do is they ask people, you know, like, on a scale of so-and-so, how much of a fruit is apple? Or how much of a bird is a robin? And so the higher this rating value is, the closer it is to our prototype for a fruit. So apple, 6.25, very, very high, right? If we go down to the peach, also very high. Pear, pretty high. If we go down to the bottom, though, is an olive a fruit? Okay, that has the lowest scores. That means that people do not associate it at all with a fruit. Is a pumpkin a fruit? Similarly, very small. Is an avocado a fruit? Also very, very low. So whenever we are uh, determining whether or not these are fruits, we can say that whatever they are, they are very different from our prototype, which is apparently an apple. That that's the first thing the best example of a fruit is an apple and these are very very different from an apple and so we rate them much lower and if we look over here with birds we see kind of the same things um so uh bat obviously should have low because it's not actually um a uh a, a bird uh but penguin has the lowest here uh robin has the highest so we said the robin is the prototype example and like I mentioned you can find this in your textbook um, if you bought uh, it brand new all right so the other view of concepts is the exemplar view the exemplar view is a little bit different and actually before I tell you about this one I do want to say that like with a lot of things in psychology um, there are people who kind of advocate for either one of these they take sides they pick teams um, but I don't think, I, I think that both the textbook and most modern research will say that it's kind of a mix of both of these things. That when we're forming concepts and we're trying to determine, you know, categories of information, that it is both the prototype view and the exemplar view, depending on the situation. Um, that is not just one or the other. There are people who do pick one or the other and they're, they're kind of extremes, but uh, just, just just so that you don't have to feel like it's one or the other. It is both, uh, just like nature and nurture. Um, all right, so when we, so the exemplar view is a little bit different because the exemplar view is like, you think of a prototype of a, of a really strong example of that category and then you start making comparisons with that, whether it be a robin for birds or an apple for fruits or a lion for mammals. The exemplar view is, ooh, we can use some, some fun terminology here. Uh, the exemplar view is bottom up. In other words, what that means is that prototype view is like you have some pre existing idea about this concept and that you are going to be judging all of these kind of iterations against that one good example. I'm going to try to stop using the word example because it's so close to exemplar here. Um, the exemplar theory is bottom up because it's data driven. What does it mean to be data driven? That means that in order for me, ooh, that is a bad uh, A, like a D. Uh, that means that whenever we are coming up with this category, we're going to analyze the data, we're going to look at the physical features, and we're going to try to draw conclusions that way. Um, so we're looking for what features are held in common, and that will be the exemplar. So if again, if I asked you, what is a mammal? And you said, well, okay, what do most mammals have in common? Well, they have fur, they have eyes, they're warm-blooded, they have a central nervous system. If that's what you're, and that's what her suit is, by the way, is her suit is that uh, you are furry, you're uh, hairy. Um, but uh, so, if you're doing that, that is an exemplar of you. Why? Because you're thinking about, okay, a dog, a lion, a gorilla, and a human, what do they share in common? They have live birth, they have fur outside of their bodies, they have four limbs, they're warm-blooded, they have two eyes, they have teeth, and things like that. Um, so, in that case, I'm looking for what mammals have in common, and I'm trying to form the category that way. So that way, it's bottom-up. We're starting at what are the what are the visual features and then working our way up 
So, um, if so, let's go with it, uh, an, another example. If you were trying to create a new category for computer, let's say that you've never seen a computer before, and the very first time you see a computer is a laptop. And this laptop is not plugged into the wall. It's just you know somebody has it on their desk when they're typing. If that's the first computer you see, and you know that it's a computer, then you're going to assume that most computers are going to be just like that. That most computers are going to be that you can pick it up and take it with you, that it doesn't need to be plugged into a wall, that it has a screen built into, um, into the machinery, that it has a keyboard built into the machinery, that um, it is bright, that you don't need it, you don't need light around it because it produces its own light, all of these things. Um, and you're going to believe that every computer is like that until you see other examples of computers that are not like that. So maybe you see a computer that is a desktop and it's plugged into the wall and you can't take it with you. It's much bigger, right? And so whenever you see other examples of computers like that, now you have to expand the category. Okay, so a laptop and a desktop can both be computers. So what do they have in common? Okay, well, maybe it's that they... Um, uh, they have keyboards, that they have visual displays, that you have to turn them on, that you know they cost so and so amount of dollars or whatever. You're thinking about what they have in common. They can get on the internet, you know, whatever. Um, so in that case, your your category can change. It can change a little bit more fluidly than than the prototype view can, because it's going to kind of change every time you learn a new example from that category. Here's a, a quick breakdown of this, uh, where you're looking at prototype view versus exemplar view. Um, all right, so if we were to talk about how they work, think about this. What is this? What kind of animal is this? Is this a mammal? Is this a bird? A reptile? An amphibian? Or a fish? Are those the only five? Are those the only five categories of the animal kingdom? I don't remember. Um, all right. So which of these is this? There's a good chance almost every single person here says that it's going to be a mammal. Maybe some of you say it's going to be an amphibian. Wishful thinking. Uh, but it is a mammal. Do you know what this animal is? I tried to pick one that I didn't think you had heard of before or seen before. Uh, these are known as slow... Loris. And if you're curious, you can check it out on YouTube. Just Google or you just search for slow Loris and you'll find lots of videos of them. You're not supposed to keep them as pets. They are very, very small. They're very, very cute, but they do not do very well in captivity. Uh, all right. So how is it that you knew that it was a, uh, uh, that it was a mammal? Um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't able to hear what you said, but I would guess that most people said mammal, but why? The reason why depends on if you're using the prototype view or the exemplar view. If you're using the prototype view, you looked at this and you said, you know what, that looks a lot like a lemur, or it looks like a lot like a monkey, and so I think it's a mammal for that reason. Uh, and if you're doing that, then you're comparing it with one central kind of stimulus from the other concept and making a comparison, and so that would be a prototype. If you looked at this and said, well, you know what, it has two forward-facing eyes, it has these ears, it has paws, and it's covered in fur, it must be a mammal, then you're using the exemplar view. All right. Um, all right, so and that's just what this says. So let's, let's move on. Um, I'm going to do like 10 more minutes, and I'll give you a break. Um, okay, so I want to talk about whether or not non-humans can learn concepts. And I think today most most folks will say yes, especially folks that are in that do non-human research will say yes that non-humans can learn concepts and it really depends on how you're defining concepts. Um, but uh, this is a really, really fun article that I came really close to assigning for you uh, this semester. But uh, people don't like reading about non-human uh, research in, in psychology. Um, I think it's because a lot of people, when they come to, you know, they come to the university, they want to be a psych major, and it's because they want to help people and they want to work with people. They don't necessarily want to work with animals or whatever, uh, and they don't want to read about animals, even if they are cute and cuddly and adorable and very smart. Uh, so um, we're going to talk about this one so that way you don't have to read it for homework. 
Uh, so the Watanabe 95 article is a really, like I said, it's a fun article and it's one that's been imitated a lot. You can find an example of someone imitating this if you go to the video that I mentioned at the very beginning of this and I said, you know, can pigeons appreciate art? That video, the guy in that video, he is not Watanabe or Sakamoto or Wakita, right? He is somebody replicating their findings. This was an article that when it came out in the mid-90s, it surprised everybody, and everybody wanted to replicate it and repeat it. Uh, and so this isn't one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, this was done one time and never again. No, people have done this for, for decades, and it's, and it's held up. And so the idea behind, and so now's a good time to watch that video if you, if you haven't seen it yet. So the idea behind this, and this is what you're doing for your discussion uh, for this chapter, is that you're going to be classifying works of art. So if you are a pigeon, then you would, pick, you would peck when you see Picasso. And what I do in the classroom is usually I will tell people to, uh, to tap on the table uh, whenever they think they see Picasso. And so that way I know whenever they think they see Picasso. But, I'll, but uh, let's do this together. So as we go through this, I want you to try to make a mental note when you think you see a Picasso. All right. Is this Picasso? Yes, it is Picasso. And so you'd be rumbling on your desk a little bit, right? Now you see this. Is this Picasso? It is not Picasso. So you would stop rumbling. You stop pecking at the screen. Is this one Picasso? This one is not Picasso. Is this one Picasso? Yes, it is Picasso. So you'd start rumbling or pecking at the screen again, right? What about this one? Is this Picasso? Yes, it is. Okay, what about this one? No, it's not. All right. If you were good at that, don't get too big ahead because pigeons can do that with 100% accuracy too after some training. Um, and if you say, <laughs> yeah, but that's only after training, well, I have to I have to tell you, you're not going to want to hear this. The only reason why you're good at it is because you've you've had training because you someone was able to put into words what Picasso was. You've seen other examples of Picasso, and the way that pigeons get good at this is just like you just like you did by seeing examples of Picasso. So what happens in this study whenever whenever you have pigeons doing this, you have them pecking whenever they see examples of Picasso, is they'll see an image like this, they'll peck at it, and they don't get any food. So they realize like, okay, well if I peck at this, it's not going to give me any food. But if I peck at this, it does give me food. So I'm going to start pecking at this. And then what happens is that over time, if you then see this, you're not going to peck at this because it doesn't look anything like these images that do look like Picasso's. And that is what we refer to as the family semblance. The family semblance is essentially what kind of physical characteristics are shared between the examples in this group. So if I were to, let's look at Picasso, right? So if we're looking at these two, how are these alike, right? How are, they're very different, but how are they alike? So what is their family semblance? Well, for starters, they have f pictures of faces in them, so that's one thing. But we also see maybe some some really stark uses of color, right? Some some deep blacks and some some high contrast here, which we see here too. Some high contrast, big thick lines, right? Um, if we're looking at these, which are Monet, how are these alike? Well, they don't really have really hard, bold lines, like. This is dark here, but there's not really lines like you see here, right? Um, and also the colors kind of move in and out of one another. They kind of blend. And they don't really as much here, right? There are more kind of solids here. So even if you had no idea who Picasso was or who Monet was, you don't need to know they even existed. All you need to do is to learn peck when you see this and don't peck when you see this. Peck when you see this don't peck when you see this. Because what you're responding to is the family semblance. You're responding to when you see bold lines and harsh colors, peck. When you see fine lines and soft colors, don't peck. That's all you have to do. That's all that it takes for pigeons to be able to appreciate art and to be able to say, yep, that's Picasso and yep, that's Monet. And whenever you put it that way, it doesn't really sound all that exciting, right? Who cares? These pigeons are just responding based on the stimuli that they see. And it's just based on the stimuli they've been trained on, and it's only because they've been taught what features they have in common. So who cares? But I think the point, and this is what I love about this, is that, is it really all that different than how you learn this? 
really the only difference in my opinion the only it's easier for us because I can tell you this is Monet and it's Monet because he used watercolors and he liked to paint pictures of harbors and and gardens and uh, and you know he he would he would use pointillism or whatever um, he was impressionist uh, so I can use all that but when I'm using a language what am I doing all I'm doing then is I'm really just kind of pointing out the family semblance I'm really just pointing out the physical characteristics so that you don't have to do by trial and error you know responding to these images to try to figure out which is which category so here now we're going to generalize I'm going to show you paintings from totally different painters and I want you to respond peck or no peck so here would you peck maybe you would I wouldn't peck here right or sorry I would peck here this does to me look like Picasso it's not Picasso but it looks kinda like Picasso same with this I'd probably peck at this too we see these these bold saturated colors right for this one I wouldn't peck right because it looks a little bit too much like Monet and what do I mean by that there's not really these bold lines and contours that the colors kind of you know blend in together here, this one's kind of tricky because I talked about, oh, you can see faces now, right? So this is an example, just like Ludwig Wittgenstein suggested. It's not a perfect example of what con what constitutes a Monet painting, right? This isn't Monet, but it is an Impressionist painting. And pigeons, when they would see this, would respond to it as if it were a, an Impressionist painting. And they'd respond to this one as if it were a Cubist painting, which it is. Um, it is not Picasso. All right. And this one is Impressionist again. All right. So now is a good time for you to take a break. Uh, we got just a little bit left. We got like 15, 20 minutes left uh, to, to round up. Actually, sorry. We got a little bit longer than that, actually. Maybe 25 minutes. Uh, so go ahead and take a quick bathroom break. Grab a, grab a drink. And we will meet back up to tackle the very end of this. Okay. So where do I... Uh, I was going to say, where do I start? I want to start by kind of... In, in talking about knowledge, knowledge is a little bit frustratingly used in this textbook, in my opinion. When I think of knowledge, I think of like trivia and facts. And what, what the textbook means by knowledge is a little bit different because it's, it's really referring to kind of like how we tie together and make connections. How do we make connections between information? How is it that we can look at pigeon and robin and sparrow and then be able to draw connections between them, right? That's what that's what we're talking about here when we talk about knowledge. So, when you read something, let's say when you read a book, when you read, I don't know, what what are the youths reading these days? I don't know. Um, whenever I was, okay, I'm trying to think of what the popular. Oh man, I'm so embarrassed. Um, I know it's not Twilight, because that was still more of my time, and it's not Fifty Shades of Grey, because it's still more of my time. I'm trying to think, like, you know, cause, and, and comic books are popular movies, but I feel like comic books, people don't really read them too much. So I'm just going to go with, um, let's go with Lord of the Rings. If you haven't read Lord of the Rings, you're missing out. It's a good, very boring book. Uh, so when, when you read Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or Twilight or any other book that's very popular, what is that you remember about that book that you like? Almost everybody will say that they remember the ending, or they remember the characters, or they remember the story. Cool. That's great. Um, but when we're reading, what we're reading, we don't see pictures of the characters, usually. We don't see pictures of the stories, either. We just see words. So how is it that we're taking those words, and we're abstracting them, and we're turning them into something different? So we don't really remember the exact words that, you know, the, the prose that we are reading, we don't really even think about how those sounds or how those words sounded in our mind, right? Instead, what we remember is what they meant, the meaning that they had. So we remember the story and the characters and the emotions involved because they meant something to us. They were important to us in some way. And you can now maybe see why all of this... It, comes right after a chapter on memory because when we're talking about the things that we remember the things that we remember yes they are memories but they are it ties in so much to what we talked about in chapter 8 right 
that is going to be things that are vivid, things that are meaningful, like semantic level of processing, don't forget about that. Um, things that are integrated in our frameworks of knowledge that already have some connection that are important to us. So we typically remember not the text, but the emotions and the story and the characters that are involved there. So when we're talking about how we represent our knowledge, it really depends on how we are engaging with that information. So it changes depending on how we are grappling with it. Uh, because we can we can represent that visually, auditorial, auditorially, or semantically. And you know this because we talked about it in Chapter 6 when we were talking about Craig and Tolving's levels of processing, right? And about how, like, if you are just processing something visually, so what would that mean in this case for reading something? It'd be like remembering what the book pages look like. And if you remember what the book pages look like, you're not really going to remember much about the book, right? Um... What about if you remember how the book, how the words in the book sounded, right? Maybe you could repeat to me a couple of phrases from the book. That'd be a little bit better, right? But really, if you want to remember the book, it would be helpful to remember what everything in it means and what all the characters went through and things like that, right? So you may remember we, we did this example uh, with the penny uh, uh, previously. If I were to ask you which one is the real penny, we would say that it's A. But why was it A? Back in chapter 6, we said, well, it's because you haven't processed this semantically. That we look at this and we just encode the surface level pieces of it. Because we don't need to know the details of it, right? So this brings us to a study in the 60s from Warner. Uh, and Warner had this really kind of fun um, uh, study where Warner wanted people to read some sentences and then he warned them and he said I'm going to change something in this text um, and for some of them he changed the the what the words meant and for some of them he just changed kind of the the synonyms just changed you know like the styling of the words so maybe you know like he substituted in instead of grocery store he said supermarket you know, um, but if you said like I'm going to the store or I'm going to the supermarket, they both they mostly mean the same thing. So we're kind of changing the appearance of that sentence. If I said I'm going to the I'm going to the parking lot, that is very very different. So that I changed the content of that sentence, right? So basically, Warner was interested in will people notice the difference. Uh, whenever we change these things, whenever we change the appearance of the sentence or we change the content of the sentence. So these are the uh, the findings from that 1968 article. So basically what he found is that he warned some people like, hey, just let you know, I might change something in this in these sentences. Oh, sorry, that would be the warned condition. And then others, he just didn't. He didn't even tell them that he might change them. But what he found is that whenever he changed the word for the meaning, so like he changed the word grocery store or supermarket into something totally different like hospital or school, that people picked up on it almost 100%. This one looks like it drops, but look, that's like 95, 96%, right? So that's really, really good. Um, so whenever we change the meaning of the sentence, people recognize it almost perfectly. If we changed the style of that sentence, if I said, I am going to the grocery store, if I said, I am traveling to the grocery store, that's an example where I've changed the style up a little bit, and I wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have noticed, right, that that had changed. Or if I said, um, I will go to the grocery store, right? Uh, that is slightly changing up the style a little bit. Maybe that's not a good, good example, because you can argue that's changing the meaning too. But if I said, um, uh, hmm, oh, I should have thought about this a little bit more deeply before I tried to give you an example off the top of my head. Um, if I said, instead of saying I'm going to the grocery store, if I said, I am Next, I'm going to the grocery store, where I'm adding in an unnecessary word. That would be an example of how I change the style, and people generally don't notice that. 
So what does that mean? Basically what that means is that when we are remembering sentences, that we're not actually remembering the words. We're not actually remembering the syntax of the grammar. But instead, we are remembering the meaning of that. That's when we notice that things have changed, is when we have changed the meaning. So Wiccans, Delos Wiccans, who in my opinion is also kind of a one-hit wonder um, in, in psychology. He doesn't really come up all that much outside of this uh, stuff. But Delos Wiccans uh, published this book called Encoding Categories of Words. And basically he argued that when we can, that our brain is very efficient. And by efficient, I mean lazy. And what I mean by lazy is that if our brains can, our brain is going to take the shortcut any chance it can. It doesn't like to work all that much. And that's not a judgment against you, dear, dear viewer, dear audience member. That's just how the brain works. It just naturally prefers to do, you know, the, the process that requires the least amount of effort. Um, it doesn't make your brain lazy. It makes you, if you're a hardworking student, it makes you all the more impressive because you have to work against your brain. You have to trick your brain into working. Um, but basically what he's arguing is that our brains are very, very kind of lazy. And so if we are learning something new, if we're reading something, if we're watching something, if we're having a conversation with somebody, that we're going to try to store that information in the most efficient way possible. And in almost every case, that efficient way is going to be a lingual code. What the heck does lingual code mean? Lingual meaning based from linguistics. Uh, so it is a word. It is a, we are going to remember things as words when we can. And the reason for that is because words and language are very easy for our memory to work with. And you may remember this because when we talked about remembering numbers, back in chapter seven, I think it was, when we were talking about how to memorize the list of pi, the 100 digits of pi, one of the steps was converting that stuff in, from numbers into words. And that's because our brain is very good with words. So when we can encode these, these events as words, we do. Um, but not all stimuli can be encoded as words. And here are a couple of examples. So I'm going to uh, give you a couple of images. I want you to tell me if they, are, if they are the same or different. So I want you to look at this. Is this the same? as this? Are they different? Have you seen this yet? You would say no. Okay, have you seen this yet? You would say no. Have you seen this yet? You would say no. Or you might say, well, I saw the back of one, right? That's what I saw here. But no, you know, you didn't see many repetitions here. That was very, very easy. Cool. You're great. I admire you for being so great. Awesome job. Keep it up. Let's do it again. All right. Have you seen this? No, it's the first one. Okay, cool. What about this one? Have you seen this one yet? No. Have you seen this one yet? Maybe. <laughs> Have you seen... Oh, sorry, I skipped over a few, it looks like. Okay. Um, but either way, if I asked you, have you seen that? Right, like, what would you call this? You could say it's a kaleidoscope. Cool. What about this? It's a kaleidoscope. What about this? It's a kaleidoscope. What about this? It's a kaleidoscope. Kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope. So if I show you a picture of this, and I ask you, have you seen this before? The reason why this is a very hard task, or in some of you, it may have been easy for you, but if we were to do this with hundreds of examples, you could see how this would get really hard. Um, the reason why this is so much harder is because I, my default is that I'm going to, I'm going to, um, encode this as the word kaleidoscope. It's a kaleidoscope. But I can't do that for all of them because all of them are kaleidoscope, right? And so maybe one way that, and so what people have done in the research when they've tried to do this task is that instead of just saying, oh, it's a kaleidoscope, they'll say like, all right, I'm gonna remember this one because it looks like a rose. And so they'll remember the word rose associated with this one because it's got the rose right here in the middle. This one I'm gonna remember as green pentagon because it's got a green pentagon in the middle. This one I'm going to call um, the Green Pincers because these little things right here remind me of pincers of a beetle. So that's what I'm going to call it. And so if I'm doing that, what am I doing now? Now I'm not remembering or I'm not going to be remembering 
the, in, the, the visuals, I'm going to be remembering the word that I associate with those visuals, right? And so again, my brain is trying to be lazy by not actually trying to encode that visual information to be remembered later. This is why, just to make a connection with previous chapter, I talked about Stephen Wiltshire, um, in, in, he was in the videos that I posted on, the, you know, in, embedded in the slides. He was the guy that can remember cityscapes and draw them from memory. The reason why he's so good at that is because he, his brain doesn't work this way. His brain doesn't encode words as easily, and so he, he is much easier for him to encode visuals. And so he can, his brain is able to store visuals like this instead of storing the word associated with the visual. So, when doing the coin task, that was super easy because all you have to do is say, okay, dime, penny, quarter, nickel, and then whenever you see another nickel, you can probably say like, yeah, I saw that because you don't have to remember the exact nickel, you just remember that, you remember you saw the word. Um, all right, so that is how knowledge is stored. Knowledge is stored mostly linguistically, is based in language in a lot of cases. So, uh, and this is a figure from your textbook. This is how it tries to show that um, uh, the way that knowledge is represented in the brain, where we might have these kinds of concepts stored throughout our cortex. So you see the word animals, and within animals you have connections with these other pieces of information. They have hearts, they eat food, they breathe, and they have skin. And so if I were to say, is a bird an animal? you're going to immediately think, okay, do birds have hearts, eat food, breathe, and have skin? Are cats an animal? You're going to do the same thing. Are dogs an animal? You're going to do the same thing. If I say, uh, do cats, or sorry, do birds lay eggs? Um, you would say, yes, right? Because it's associated with that. But if I said, do animals lay eggs? It would take a little bit of time to think about that because you're not just thinking about this over here. Now you have to think about, okay, well, birds lay eggs and birds are animals, so yeah, they do, right? Either way, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that a lot of this knowledge is represented using lingual codes. That is, a lot of it's built out of these propositions that we have previously learned using really complex arrays of trial and error and associative conditioning and learning and things like that, like you learned about in Dr. Reyes or Dr. Andrade's uh, learning classes. Um, all right. One fun thing about this, another connection that we can make is that this relates to the spreading activation model of memory, which you may remember, like, if I were to ask you, uh, you know, if I said the word pigeon is going to, uh, it's going to also elicit memories of birds, and of eggs and of flying and things like that because they are associated with a pigeon. And these are also um, uh, can't, the, this this is also um, tested and studied using sentence verification tasks as well. Just like we saw for for the prototype view, where people are looking at you know saying yes or no for these things. And one fun thing about this, and I remember this one example is like uh, Plato. No, sorry, it was Socrates. Socrates was Greek. Yes or no? Socrates had one hand. Yes or no? So in this case, you're just answering yes or no for both of these, right? Socrates was Greek. If you know anything about Socrates, you're probably pretty quick to say, like, yes, he was Greek. He was one of the Greek philosophers, right? That's something that we know about Socrates. It's one of the few things we know about Socrates. What are the other things about Socrates? Ooh. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Socrates because I, I, I haven't talked about history yet. You know, i gotta, I got to smuggle some history fun facts into every single uh, chapter. But yeah, uh, Socrates was Greek. The other thing you can learn about Socrates is that, um, so Plato, you know, was his... His mentee was the person he trained, and Plato um, drove him crazy because Socrates really firmly believed that 
uh, at the time that people were getting stupider, people were getting dumber, because people were relying too much on the written word. They were they were relying too much on, on writing things down. And that because they were writing things down, they were becoming stupider because they weren't using their mind when they could be memorizing things and engaging in things rhetorically and, you know, uh, and, and Plato wanted to write all this stuff down. Uh, and so that's kind of funny, right? Uh, which is also part of the reason why so much of what we know about Socrates is because Plato wrote it down. So who's laughing now? Anyways, Socrates, um, ooh, another fun fact, well, Actually, I'm not going to tell you how, about how he died. Uh, it's very interesting, though, and there's a lot of controversy about whether or not... Well, I, I'm not going to get into it. Um, all right, so what about Socrates had one hand, yes or no? This one takes people longer to say yes or no to. But why? Why does this one take longer? The reason why, and the answer, by the way, is no. He had two hands. He didn't have just one hand. But the reason why this one takes longer for us to think about is because we don't know anything about Socrates in his hand. We haven't heard about that at all, right? So it's not associated with Socrates very much. But him being Greek is associated with it quite a bit, right? Um, so, uh, so what does this mean? It means that the association of Socrates is Greekness. His, you know, the the degree to which he was Greek is important to our understanding of Socrates, right? That's a big part of what we know about him. It ranks very highly in terms of the connections that we make with him. In terms of whether or not he has one hand or two hands, it takes us a long time to respond. The reaction time is very high because we don't associate handedness at all with Socrates. So it takes us a while to think about it. So the faster the reaction time, the stronger the connection you have, the stronger association you have with those things. Um, and so you can kind of see this also here where you're looking at reaction time. So a canary is a canary. Ooh, that's fastest reaction time, right? But a canary has skin is the slowest reaction time, which is really funny, right? But even you, when you're thinking about this, you're like, wait a second, do canaries have skin? I guess they do. It takes a while to think about because we don't ever see it, right? But that's where their, fair, fe their feathers come out of their skin. I guess that you see... You see their skin when you know if you're eating if you're eating chicken, um, but it's not one of those things that we associate with them, right? Very much, and so it's longer reaction times. It takes them slower to react uh, and make that. Uh, and so we would say that skin is not an important feature for our concept of being a canary. Um, and then this final slide here is just like looking at how these things are connected. I'm not going to test you on this because to me, this is very hypothetical in terms of the modeling that they're doing here for Cognitive Psych. Uh, but basically, uh, the textbook asserts that when you look at knowledge, that knowledge can be broken down into a, a, a list of propositions. So for example, a dog can chew a bone. So the dog is the agent here. The object is the bone, and we're looking at how they are related. Dogs and bones are related because they chew. Dogs and cats are related because they are chaste. Uh, dogs and meat are related because dogs eat meat, and so on. But again, really what I think this is just showing you how these things are related linguistically, and we make these propositions out of that, out of those simple connections. All right, we made it. Thank you so much for tuning in with me. And uh, next chapter is language, which is maybe one of the longest chapters uh, of the semester, um, but hopefully one that answers a lot of questions that maybe you had about language. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you later. Bye-bye.